Welcome. This is the April 4th Beehive Production User Call. We have Andrew, Daniel, Patrick, Glenn, Hans, and myself, Michael. And Daniel, it sounds like you have used the Fudo virtual appliance on Beehive. Do you have a like three-second description of that? Uh, about Fudo or about what I'm doing specifically? Both. So, yeah. So Fudo is uh, a, a, just a brilliant jump post. Um, basically, you can use um, uh, Fudo handles the authentication. And then that can connect to either, either pass through the authentication to uh, the target host um, or, uh, or it can use completely different credentials entirely. So for example, you could give somebody um, access to uh, an SSH server without ever giving them credentials that are on the box itself. Nice. Um, it works with, um, well, the, the, the quote unquote, uh, well, the less expensive version, the, the typical rollout version, which I'm using, works with SSH and RDP. Um, so I'm hooking that up for virtual desktop recording uh, for for a client so for compliance reasons. So it's a high compliance environment, um, and everybody goes through the jump host. And it's it's just you log into the website, you click once, and it fires your RDP with a hidden pet with a um, you know with a uh, with a hidden connection string. And really, it's just it's just that you type the password once, you click something on the web host, and then the actual Windows Microsoft Windows RDP client opens on the on the jump host server. It's completely seamless. They don't even know uh, what's happening. But then Fudo handles recordings for you. It's a it's a brilliant system. And what I was happy to find out is that it it does work. Um, I, I tested it several years ago, and and actually. I believe uh, Pavel fixed a problem on Fudo, which which was causing it not to boot on uh, Beehive, but it actually works perfectly fine on Beehive now. And of course, my Windows uh, desktop servers are on Beehive as well. So it's a full blown Beehive system, and you know, I mean, that kind of rollout is easy to do, and you can very easily beat the price of Azure um, Remote Desktop. So this is a you know, for for any any MSPs or uh, or, or larger organizations that are thinking about Azure uh, Desktop, and you have some data center space, this is a super easy way to do it, and you get recordings, and it's it's you know it's just great. That was more than three seconds, but I love it. Um, so, would you think it's it's adequate to call it uh, guacamole on steroids? Or you took like my, the words out of my mouth. Go ahead. I I mean, yeah, really on steroids, though. It, I mean, it, it's 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 so much. I mean, obviously, there's the GUI, but the but the engineering of it is is really smart. Like it it does, handles upgrades with uh, internally. Now, I poked around a little bit. I don't know if I was allowed to do that on my license, but it's it uses ZFS based updates. It's it's just a it's just a brilliantly crafted piece of uh, uh, jump post. Well worth the money, in my opinion. Uh, you're not going to you're not going to be able to 20, 20 per head per month uh, for okay. the for the cheaper version. Um, yeah. Oh, there's a there's a free version for five five users. I think. Oh no, I'm kidding! Wait, what? Have, Dude. This is brand new. This is this <sighs> is brand new, um, and it it is. Like I mean, if you if you need guacamole for one thing, I mean, I would <laughs> I would rather use this. Then you get the recordings, also. Um, um, and typically, I'm firing up guacamole because I want to, you know, control control people's access through through a web browser or whatever. So, um, oh, and and it has a web console as well. I mean, obviously, you're not going to want to do that for SSH and RDP, but it has that as a backup. I mean, are they using? It, jails to have the whole trifecta in one i would assume there's there's jails involved because it is a you know it is it is definitely built as a secure uh system so um now now the i should note that the configuration of the system is is um it's sort of configured as a firewall so you have one ip address on the in one interface on you're supposed to have one on the WAN side and one on the LAN side or one on the VPN side and one on the internal network side, um, either with VLANs or networks, um, which I mean, that's, I, it's, there's, 
I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a, uh, it's and it's it's designed to be a heavy duty firewall, basically, and and jump host. That's awesome. Uh, if let's someone should find a link to the free version, or I'll do it right now. Fudo, I've used. Yeah, I don't know what the terms are, but oh. uh, FudoSecurity.com dot com yeah. and Fudo One yeah. is there. Supreme or their free version, right? Security.com slash download dash en. Assuming, of course, you speak English. Yeah, so right, and it's it's five it's five users. I don't know what the limitations are in terms of corporate use and stuff like that, but, sure, but I, I, yeah, I, I mean, it's 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 great. I have used it in the past for, um. A lot of popular. You know, I hired somebody. I needed them to go through a ton of receipts, and they had access to accounting stuff. And I used it for, you know, for for recording their RDP sessions, and it worked. It worked quite well. This this time, I'm doing it on a much bigger scale, so 20 users, um, and it seems to be going great so far. Uh, Fudo One Three is three users and three servers. Oh, that's for the that's the free. Three, yeah, three, a free, three. That's the free, the fully free version. Got it. That's uh, great. I, I've got a situation that could use that right now. So yeah, uh, okay, it's... that's awesome. I wish I knew that two weeks ago. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah, it's particularly great. I mean, it just it just lowers the bar for getting admins on your, you know, to to get some help on your network also. Um. Wow, and you can yeah, you can also do just a, a dot a, you know dot ssh slash config and set it up as a jump post, so it's completely transparent to the user, but you're recording everything they do. Awesome, nice. Okay, yeah, that that is glorious. Uh, anything else on that point, short of the fact that I really want to look into it after this is done. Mm. Okay, uh. Hans, it sounds like you have some time available mid-April, and out of absolute dumb luck coincidence, I talked to uh, the, the, the Corvin K about what would be needed for uh, TPM emulation, not to be confused with pass-through, and Goran kindly ported the TPM payload from IBM that just happens to be permissively licensed and is the one used by QEMU. So it was like, it can't possibly be that clear a path, but it happened to be, occasionally we have nice things in the context of XZ Hell. So he mapped out what is involved with that. And as fellow country people, you could uh, communicate in the time zone and language if you like. Uh, you should probably have his contact information. If you don't have it, I'll find it. If you want to take a peek at that, bang out a a, a statement of work, go for it. And it uh, coincidentally, further coincidentally, uh, Daniel and I, you talked, you and I talked about, uh, gee, how do we, you know, make uh, certain things happen in an efficient manner? And it's like, well, here's a bite-sized one. So, Hans, any questions regarding that whole notion, uh, uh, aspirational as it is? Um, no, <laughs> I really just need to take a look at that and cool. try to understand what it is and what's it about and what's needed for me. Uh, if, uh, for me. <laughs> to what degree are you familiar with the broader TPM situation in Windows 11 land? Uh, I'm not. Uh, Let me all. tell you. Okay, so uh, Microsoft has been pushing for various generations of TPM chips in hardware so that you can have amazing features like a new HP laptop shipping with uh, BitLocker encryption by default and not telling the user and then keeping the key in the TPM. So that's cool, but not telling them to back it up in any way, shape or form. And if they're not AD connected and happen, having, happen to having a group policy to save it off, a BIOS upgrade can flush the TPM, lose your key and instantly ransomware yourself. It's an amazing feature. Thank you very much. So the workaround to date that they use in their product, not that it's a workaround, it embraces it, is to have the host TPM on their workstations, which is like a workstation running FreeBSD and Beehive that gives you GPU pass-through and 
USB to make it sure look like a Windows machine because it's like 80% a Windows machine and hiding under the hood beehive in FreeBSD. Well, they pass it through and you can save keys to the hardware. And if your motherboard dies, you can lose your keys and be locked out of your machine. Thank you very much. What a freaking concept, says data protection guy. And so that's still a thing. And if used carefully, that's a pretty good security solution. If screwed up, it's an absolute self-inflicted ransomware with no chance of getting around it. However, um, do, to do, 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 uh, you can get around the TPM requirement with say a, a few commands during installation. I have put those in my latest auto on attend XML for uh, my deployment scripts and those are on GitHub. I can point you to them, but it's a thing. It's showing up on all new hardware. It's one of the fundamental requirements for Windows 11 on a modern PC, which at the same time is also relegating millions of hardware devices to the recycling center and landfills because they don't have that chip. So emulation is a key thing. Uh, and I think that containing a Windows desktop on, say, Beehive is very important. I just gave a talk about that in Taipei. So there is my little highly biased take on Windows TPM. But having it be emulated would be a very helpful thing to have Windows 11 guests fire up easily. And I've been running Windows Server for like six months plus in production, just as Daniel has been, which he mentioned. And Windows on Beehive is a proven thing such that this one little feature is a blocker. And Patrick, I believe you mentioned on a on a uh, enterprise working group call. That would be sure nice to have uh, pass through and emulation. Well, one is in place, one is not. Hans, let her rip. Go for it. Talk to Corvin. He's a great guy. And hopefully you two can make some magic happen and just let us know what would help compensate that work. How's that? Yeah, sounds good. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I saw this on a certain social media platform that people are generally kind of abandoning randomly. It was, they didn't mention the fact that it's NetBSD, but I thought that's also quite cool. It is a simple management system for NetBSD virtual machines. There I'm seeing QEMU, but I don't know if they mean Haxum or Zen or many of, of the of NVMM or one of the three hypervisors on, free, on NetBSD. So I've got the link there. Maybe there's some good ideas to embrace or run with, you name it. There it is. Okay. Uh, this came up in various conversations. Um, in the context of Vulture being Vultures, uh, if you haven't read the news, Michael W. Lucas has two nice port, uh, articles on that blog post that I've linked here. Uh, the whole notion of a super private use of a public hypervisor, as aspirational as that might be, is a hot topic, thanks to the recent uh, XZ news. And Vulture is saying, hey, all your content belongs to us, which is uh, not quite the, what we signed up for. So the question is, does Oxide use AMD SEV, the secured virtualization extensions? And uh, Josh uh, Clulo said, hey, yeah, no, not yet. And then Jan said, good Lord, good luck with that. Who knows if that's truly securable? So in the big picture, yeah, let's look at security extensions and their meaningful use. And Jan mentioned, hey, there's the PSC, the Platform Security Ser Controller Services, and you might never know if your host is actually using them, so you might not have the benefit. So who the heck knows? There's that topic. Do with it what you please. Now, as per a conversation the last 12 hours, Tom Jones saw on these calls the mentions of, was it VP, VSS, VPP, the virtual packet processing or whatever new feature. I'd have to check the docs, which one that was. Um, but that also triggered a parallel conversation on, okay, so we've been discussing Beehive networking performance for years now. And uh, my focus of the hour is actionable things. And thank you, Christoph Provost, for making a faster bridge on FreeBSD. Yeah, you and Alumos land have crossbow and warm towels and nice things. But one thought is to simply detrace the heck out of a simple bridge tap configuration. 
and see where those pain points are because one low hanging fruit might be the fact that both the bridge and the tap devices are like single queue. Have a nice day. Jan's not available to fill us in with the details, but uh, uh, in a simple, simple, simple. The bridge is not anymore, which was the point of Christoph's entire project. Okay, so it is multi queue, and yes, they made a point that it is. Uh, missing D-Trace hooks because it's a pretty old piece of software, maybe back from okay. like five days back when you know the giant lock was removed. Uh, good to know. Uh, K K K P at made, made the bridge multi. So it might be down to uh, looking at making the tap device multi queue because it's so easy and the the other mm -hmm. version of tap that's just a different name for the same thing that behaves a little differently. Mm -hmm. uh, any other insights, Patrick, on that? Nothing beyond the press release. I'm just looking up the article by the foundation and linking it into the next. Perfect. Perfect. That, yes. And and we're all grateful for his work, no question. But still, there are bottlenecks where it's like, well, I have 10 gig networking. Why do I get like five, 4.99 or whatever? So while you're finding that, and you can either drop it in context or I'll paste it in the right place. So uh, this person reached out. Is it Phil? Let's see. Boom, boom. Uh, this guy. So uh, this came up on the Fediverse. Phil Dennis Jordan in uh, Austria is like, hey, uh, I'm having weird uh, PCI pass-through issues. And that's been a hot, hot pain point for people because it either works fantastically well or horribly badly. And he made a brilliant little observation there. He was using uh, UEFI boot as one should, but then for just pure kicks, and I had never considered this, he went to grub and boom, the issues went away. So there might be initialization issues and he found a way to test them. So that is beautifully actionable and something to add to the various test suites that are obviously needed to exercise, you know, IOMMUs and PCI pass through, especially on AMD, where on Epic systems, poor um, Santiago has had major pain, major pain. So uh, is there anyone present who's either using PCI pass through or has had issues with it? This is actionable for me. I'm so glad he spelled that out. Uh, yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm. I, I know what I know. I have the hardware I have. I have the time that I have, and simply knowing to try the different boot strategies with the exact same configuration otherwise is super helpful. Not. Yeah. Uh, I fit in the category of not yet, but yep. maybe in a couple of weeks as I set up. I'm going to be setting up a machine at my house, so. Yep. I'm I'm waiting on pieces to come in, and I will likely want to do some some pass through stuff for GPUs. Perfect. I've had yeah. I've had mixed results lately. There was a, um, a high end GPU that I was trying to get through to a to a Linux uh, VM for for. Uh, an ML application for a financial company and it couldn't it just it just wouldn't it wouldn't detect it on the other side hmm. I, I don't think I was doing anything wrong because I've done pass through before but I, I was wondering if there could be anything with with that class of device that would that could potentially like theoretically cause problems I mean to be to be honest I, I gave up and then the client decided not to care about it but um yeah, so there's an expensive GPU hanging around that isn't isn't being used at the moment. Um, that is all very good to know. Unfortunately, Corbin's company is living and dying by GPU pass through to that aforementioned Windows Windows desktop, as it appears to the user. And uh, it was VPP that's in question. So. Uh, I also spent hours upon hours with it in Taipei with some ThinkPads and then uh, two desktops upon return. And I could absolutely for the life of me not get it working. So uh, I will try to find the same hardware that or similar hardware to Beckhoff and just 
keep pushing to it because I have a use case for that that would rock my world. So uh, watch this space. It is an open, ongoing topic. Um, something we will not be discussing is Jan's new UCL macros, but he's been pushing ahead with that. And we brain dumped some examples on the last call that I put here to push him forward. So he would also love to know if you have ideas for new UCL macros because he's mapping it out and banging out and have a nice day. So this will find a home, but that's not for today. So any other topics before discussing the elephant in the room as we've been calling it? So there have been uh, a, a whole lot of parallel discussions, but the absolute sort of anchor point has been a register article about how TrueNAS Core is moving away from FreeBSD at some point in the future, partly because they don't have a plan to move to FreeBSD 14, despite the fact that on one of these calls, Alexander Moulton specifically said in January they were hoping to have a 14. But also he said, and it's all recorded, so I'm not <laughs> saying anything that's like not public. Uh, he said they generally wait for a dot one. So when 14.1 arrives, he, his impression was they're moving to that. But in the meantime, there have been a whole lot of conversations. There's been a whole lot of FUD flying back and forth. There is apparently a surprise that the forums, which have been a lovely controversial place to have brilliant information and and not always accurate information fly around. Uh, apparently Monday at 8, 12 a.m., the forums will be moving to their next edition. Gee, I wonder if that means the old content will just magically vanish overnight. Uh, Patrick, what first, starting with the forums, what can you tell about this? And no, it's not an April Fool's joke. They, they have a new forum on, on based on this course. I mean, I can perfectly understand that they want to move to an entirely self-hosted and an open source platform. Okay. I'm, I'm not familiar with this with this course. I guess I've, I've seen it once before. With some arbitrary open source product I use, but I forget which one can be or or some closed source Unify or or something whatever. I like traditional forums that make the best use of screen real estate and uh, plain text search and plain text features way better. So I'm not at all inconvenienced by the fact that OpenSense, for example, still uses simple machines, which just works. <laughs> period. Um, yeah, came to me as a complete surprise. I registered at the new forum. I cannot say more at the moment. Okay. I've just been stating on the on the old forum that I hate the new interface because it wastes a third of your screen real estate for navigation, gizmos, widgets, whatever that nobody needs. And uh, yeah, on the plus side, it takes markdown instead of BB code, which is good. But we will see where where this leads. I mean, many of the of the old users already stated no, not three quarters, one third. One third. Yeah, if user one one third is gone, which which is significant. I mean, I want to make the most out of. Well, there's life. a comment there about it not being great on yeah. mobile, so that could yeah, definitely whatever. Be. Okay. And yeah, many like, of the regulars don't like it. Some people do like it. It's doubtful what the future of the old forum will be. Um, mm -hmm. I system stated they will switch it to read-only mode and keep it up so it can be found by search engines forever. <laughs> someone someone called them out and asked the same forever, like the support for TrueNAS Core. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Yeah, and and, uh, and that's just the situation. Well, on, on, on the plus side, the latest thing I did in, in technical uh, era is uh, I just installed the latest green TrueNAS 13.3 nightly, and it works quite well. It's, it's going to be 13.3 now, the new TrueNAS release, to line up with the FreeBSD release. It works. You can run FreeBSD 13.3 patch level one. Are we already? Uh, Jay is on it rather nice so they're definitely working hard to make this a good release okay this but is good. i i guess it will be the last <laughs> well yeah it's and 
the whole broader context is suspicious. And let me bring up a point from the just a recent call here. It's like there's an ongoing Reddit discussion about, oh, no, you know, FreeBSD is dying, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And this comment that, Daniel, you brought to the table, which is like, well, wait a minute. Uh, there are issues with open ZFS that are only on FreeBSD and in asking around in a few minutes, it's like, well, that was all solved years ago. What, 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 uh, that's a bit of a strange statement to belt mm -hmm. out there and stand by and use as a defense. So uh, that was a, a lot of things are not adding in. Guys. Yeah, it's that a gun the poncho that, happens yeah. to be Jim with, <laughs> Jim Thompson with it. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Could you drop that link in the chat? Okay, gladly. It doesn't belong in the in the notes. Uh, so I will make a note there. And my okay. comment flat out on the call was like, "Hey, I smoke, <laughs> but sorry, uh, they're not making sense." And while he's not here, Antonig has been doing testing with a one terabyte RAM system where he, for driver support alone, he's using FreeBSD because Linux couldn't handle like the RAID card or the NIC. What a concept. Um, he hit limits that uh, exist on Linux KVM, but not Beehive, like virtual CPUs and amount of RAM. I think there's an amount of RAM issue, and there's a list on this same page or otherwise that you can take a peek at. So it's this bizarre um, chorus of often incorrect information used as justifications to say, hey, the BSD is dying, which is the oldest trope in the book. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what to make of all this, but let's just keep the facts flying rather than uh, nonsense. A I think I think one thing is true that the that the defaults for the different systems are are different, and mm -hmm. you know, because there are defaults before you know before optimizing before tuning happens, certain types of systems such as memory starved little appliances might have you know, different behavior than an average desktop or server. And I don't think that that's, you know, I don't think that's a mark against one operating system or another. I mean, one distro to another could be totally different um, in, in Linux land. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm embarrassed that I sort of fell for the FUD. Don't worry about that because, you know, prominent names in the community are distributing it. And so that's the, you, I do encourage you to listen to yesterday's open ZFS call because we're like, okay, so when it comes to arc management, uh, yeah, do we like have to just step back and go with defaults or do we actually get to keep our jobs and get to like uh, make, you know, things happen? So let me actually bring that up because it, it FUD is one thing. Uh, Jan belting out a description of an ARC management mechanism that could be also uh, user accessible through uh, virtual file systems and truncating devices that are you know thin, but they actually represent swaths of RAM. And I mean, he just he just launched into it after the recording, which kind of encouraged it. But here, I documented everything he was saying as he was going in real time. So I know that vocalizing such thing is uh, pretty darn critical to users. So yeah, okay, is my kind of take on all this. And by the way, Stu has some NAB tickets if you happen to be in Vegas in a few weeks. But so yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know if we should just have a lovely tracker on all this. And my joke in all of it is like, I hope Netflix will fund my documentary on on how BSD is dying and you know, distribute it <laughs> on free BSD. It's like, yeah, okay. Like, sure. Um, yeah. Um, I heard concerns in Taipei that, gee, the Intel home networking department covers 2.5 gig and it's a bit chaotic compared to the server division. So a certain router vendor had to write their own 2.5 gig driver and they don't like that fact. Uh, so I guess Linux magically solves that. And there was a comment at the vendor summit in San Jose in what, November or October that like, there are <laughs> lots of drivers for Linux. They're mostly reference drivers and your production one is kind of left to the reader. Like, um, okay. So there's yeah. truth in all of this, but sorry, uh, a lot of it is... Mm. It's, it's it's like Linux and Docker will magically fix IX systems completely botched development model. I mean, that's just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> when when we, Chris Moore is publicly stating that you cannot build an appliance on top of a stock operating system distribution, he's just not saying the truth. I, I don't claim he's intentionally lying, but we our hosting environment called the ProServer is an appliance. We built that completely automated every month, and we roll up out updates on the latest FreeBSD 13.2p, whatever it is, with the latest ports, about five, six hundred packages in the system of them, the latest what is in the quarterly tree every single month. And Netflix runs current. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there, there are a lot of cool facts here. I totally envy you, Illumos folks, to be like looking at each other and snickering like these aren't problems we have. But at the same time, it's like, oh, gee, Solaris and friends have been dying forever, yet yeah. people are living and dying by it. And Upside <laughs> is like charting out new territory with open hardware in million dollar data center deployments using Beehive. It's like, well, whoops. <laughs> yeah, okay. And if I'm to beat up on other publicly fact-based things, it's like, oh, you know, Beehive sucks on TrueNAS. Well, you don't have NVMe emulation, which from my perspective is a text string in a config file. I'm like, oh, you know, that we can't be done. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, Beehive sucks on TrueNAS, not Beehive sucks. Those are very different things because upstream has never been better Mm -hmm. Oh, I have yeah my my experiences, and then I politely yeah. reach out to the floor. Plus, plus like, Beehive on Trunas yeah. is still good enough to run in production. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I can confirm two domain controllers, all virtual workloads, all on Trunas thirteen dot zero at the moment. And I I would also add to with with the whole when when people are saying oh Trunas core Beehive sucks yada yada. It boils down to the fact IS IX systems did not take the time to do a proper web binding implementation. So it, it's it's kind of like you know uh, you know clamped together in, in in a hurry, and then of course people are going to see a, a, a mediocre uh, yeah. performance. You need you need to have a bring a heck of a lot of, of knowledge about what goes on under the hood to get the networking and the bridging and everything correct, because the UI by default does not do it correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've, you've been waving that flag for years at this rate, right? Yeah. Uh, That's not... I did bridging needs love, which Patrick has been saying for years. Saying for, yeah, so, uh, also, referring to the public record on that lengthy Trunas core thread, which might be within reach, um, I reached out on a situation with a client with Trunas scale, and it's like, well, they want to go from four gig drives to eight gig drive, terabyte drive, sorry, four terabyte to eight terabyte. And like, I was having lots of trouble. And so in Linux land, one of the three ways to re-sniff a drive and re-sniff the partition table doesn't require a reboot, which is kind of nice on a NAS. Uh, but unfortunately, it seems that the the GUI for TrueNAS scale doesn't yet support going from, say, four terabyte drives to eight terabyte drives. And if I'm not mistaken, I suspect ZFS has done that from day one. I suspect nearly every product based on it can do that. And I suspect there might be um, some bizarre use case where say PF sensor, open sensor over the boot drive doesn't do it, but for the data pool, you think it's kind of assumed. Go ahead, Andrew. ZFS <laughs> can have an issue right there. And it's at that point because that happens to be where a lot of times the A shift changes. Fair enough. Uh, and so if the, there, I, as far as I'm aware, there's no, at least no easy way to change the A shift on a live on a, on a pool like that. Yeah. Right. So you need to, to plan in advance a bit. But the, the main issue with scale at the moment mm -hmm. is that they do not expand the underlying partitions. Uh, and FreeBSD and Linux, contrary to Illumos, do not use raw disk devices for ZFS, but use partitions, GPT partitions of type ZFS. And these need to be expanded if you swap in a bigger disk. And then ZFS, as in its current state, will perfectly pick up the larger device. But you have to change the, the GPT layout. 
yeah, that that's absolutely true. Um, but but even so, um, you do so need to plan ahead if you're using anything four tier less and manually set your A shift to twelve um, until. A year or two ago, that wasn't possible, at least not on a Lumos. Okay, good. To so know. that's a fairly newish feature, mm -hmm. being able to set that as an option. And Are really, you still using should... raw devices? Am I still using them? Are you partitioning by default, if there is such a thing? Are you partitioning devices before putting ZFS on them, or are you uh, um, using raw devices? Depends on where. Okay, fine. For, for primary data store type stuff uh yes raw devices um but a lot of times okay. well, we'll partition it. some some ssds for using for uh separate uh separate intent logs and um additional arc just because our you know ssds are so big now and does. the amount of space that you've got for that stuff it doesn't make sense to not partition yeah, exactly. Them. Unless you want a lot of reserve blocks if the controller supports it correctly, uh, like uh, uh, L2 arc. So that said, there are some historical nuances based on my statement and yes, yeah, some edge cases, but the tr in the true NES, free NES experience, growing your disks has been a very proven thing to do. It's kind of a selling point, if you will. But... To be told that it works and then told corrected by be have them corrected by another person on the forum say no actually it's a bug it's like uh, I don't want to say you had one job but you know, kind of have one job to either know about the bug or not have the bug and it's kind of like okay well so that's in this long list of why to move to Linux including G X Z owning most potentially owning most of the ecosystem if it wasn't caught in time it's like this whole guidebook we should have like you know the the moving to linux handbook which is all so far bad news for me i'm not i'm not feeling it but maybe y'all can convince me either which way <sighs> so there i'm done soapboxing on that one anything else relating to that uh, uh, i've heard various rumblings about uh forks of TrueNAS. is there anything like public or tangible or is that just sort of people like yeah should we fork it I mean, they, the the uh, IX uh, one of the IX people in the in the forum said that it's absolutely forkable. Okay. So, is I mean, is the whole thing open source? Uh, it gets weird on their HA components, and they did them did everyone a fa favor by combining TrueNAS Core and Enterprise as a single single code base. And some features magically unlock on their own hardware with like non-transparent bridges and other goodies for HA. So as for like an intellectual property perspective, I, I don't know. Those are, there are some unknowns. There are copyright and trademark issues, maybe. Uh, that's way above my pay grade. But uh, fundamentally, I mean, it's two clicks on GitHub to have your own clone of the repo, is it not? And G uh, forking has right the whole break it you bought it factor. So it's like, really you sure you want to do that? If abandoned, yes. If active, you better be sure what you're getting into. That's just me. Anyway, yeah. So they would have to argue that if we were to rewrite the HA piece, we would have to argue that it, it isn't unique. Well, there's the um, HA that's supported by their hardware, and their hardware is few and far between. It never quite passed the eBay critical. Uh, what's the way to put it at the uh, critical mass factor if you search true NAS you get a bunch of HBAs that people have kindly flashed correctly hopefully correctly um, and Daniel I can't help but notice they've had to rewrite the replication over and over and over and gee you have a sure awesome attractive replication tool that I'm using actively and so it's called Unix. Yeah, it's called Unix. And you have to make it easy with Zelta such that, okay, one could make a case that spending a weekend on the GUI, the GUI Zelta in, in integration would be 
a good thing, given that they've had to do the heavy lifting over a decade of just kind of, you know, okay, we solve this problem, solve this one, solve this, and work our way there, which I'm very glad they've provided countless improvements to FreeBSD itself, including Beehive ones that are only now coming online. So, and presumably ZFS upstream, lots, lots of good yes. ZFS oh, upstream. Absolutely. Things. Well, Alexander Moulton, he's moved mountains and, and, Fortunately, that's cross-platform and shows up on Mac OS, Windows, you name it, wherever else. So, yeah. Uh, but let's see. Replication stands out. Any notion of HA stands out as like, okay, you know, what tools under the hood need to be anywhere with ZFS and a hypervisor and useful stuff regardless of OS? Um, I don't know. If, has anyone tried NAPIT here, which I think is this like HA or this highavailability.com which is this contraption that does some kind of nfs of ha let's see there's nap it and help me here they're using some kind of ha what's it called it is ah in deutsch um availability ba, 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 ba. here we go ha plugin i'm going to drop this in the chat I'll make a note here. Wow. Can't help but notice Zelta. HA. Can't help but notice that. Uh, they have this thing from like high .com, com, which is in, I guess it's a third party thing. RSF1. Has anyone used that? It's one of those things, every time I look at it, it's like, I have a sense of what it does but i was never convinced of its approach and like does it keep network connections open and actually will let your active samba open file get handed over magically to another system don't know anyway there are my thoughts on the subject who else has nifty nifty thoughts and while we're talking i'll move this do, 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 do. And note that things like NAPBIT apparently will drop onto, say, Illumos, your Illumos distro of choice. Kind of cool. Pardon now me. that wouldn't. That's not gonna. That's not gonna work with Beehive though until until we get memory saving, so that we can start and stop on other servers. So we're we're ways away. We we're ways out from that, right? I mean, we just got to spend resume. Uh, or yes, did we but... even? This is for a, a NAS perspective of HA where, okay, controller one is down, controller two does stuff and right. magic yeah, I was just, your file. I was just open. asking because we're on the Beehive yeah. call. Yeah, okay. Aww, <laughs> are you bringing me in line? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, yeah. Ah. Uh, <clears throat> What do what Patrick and company who brought this up? What 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 is the ultimate end game? IX is like, oh, you know, our clients want core. They're paying for systems built on core. Yeah, we'll have a fourteen. We'll 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 stick with it a little longer. What what is the end game here? Still still waiting for the guys behind the the Z vault or is it Z vault uh, I O project? Don't know if we are, can name them in this round already. Uh, when when they are ready to come out with a proposal and their their GitHub repo and everything, that's I mean, a uh, to clarify. There, there there is a supposedly most qualified team you can find at the moment already at work. Got it. Okay. And, well, and I'm perfectly stage. willing to join them with testing, with suggestions, with communication, with everything. I can't do much coding. I can do a bit coding. Okay. Cool. Um, so I am looking up Antrenig's like limits he's hit because when we're talking, um, one, we're one question, through, Michael, if you permit me, I've been please. just very quickly browsing the start of this uh, Reddit thread and the uh, the guy makes a comment about one competent person that was driven away from FreeBSD for cheap clickbait. Do you have any idea what he's referring to? 
that came up on the other call. And no, I don't. Is that I, I was not clear if that's referring to the the register article, which you know, clickbait suggests some high profile thing. Uh, and it was at that point, and the one about the oh. ZFS issues on FreeBSD, which I consider the number one open ZFS platform, given the kernel integration and upgrades actually freaking work. Um, I, I just gave up on the article right there. It's like, there's, okay. there, it's, 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 I smell FUD and I literally don't have time for that. I, I would love to, but it's like, yeah, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, Y'all can uh, justify to yourselves or otherwise on a forum at the expense of others. Like, okay. Uh, okay. No, he's, 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 referring to, he's referring to the register article as clickbait, but further down oh. below, he writes, the person who was able to, and he's referring to the vnode issues we have in the kernel, got chased out because some reporter at a different big publication decided that clickbait was more important than honest journalism. Okay. And I guess he had his moment, but FreeBSD will forever suffer for his moment of glory, and I have no idea. Is... One is this the article? Two, oh, it's searching. No, I don't want to search. Let's see, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to search for that phrase, and you said reporter. Okay. Well, first off, who wrote it? It was Gonzo we'll see Pancho. You off, okay. uh, Netgate. So yeah. Mm. So uh, that said, uh, I just lost track. Report. Here we go. Okay. So the person who was able to get chased. So let me observe that Reddit is not a uh, highly FreeBSD community oriented publication such that this is aimed at uh, a team which even among the few of us is not sure who that is. So if this statement were made on a, one of the many private-ish FreeBSD channels, it still might be not clear who it is. To the outside world, that's just pure bizarre FUD. And it's like, okay, can you give us a hint of who that is? Because if we can't Get, take have a takeaway from it i don't think the average redditor will so yeah um sorry to get into uncomfortable topics but it's like yeah not helpful the person who was able to chase out okay i mean um, we've got tea leaves to read here but yeah who who has time to read tea leaves that are already painted by this idea that Something's wrong on FreeBSD and ZFS. That I mean, I, he cannot refer to the, the, the Kip Macy incident because Kip doesn't do file system work. Right. Um, ah, I get it. I get it. You do? I uh, I guess I know. Who's, maybe who's, drop who's, in the chat and we'll very delicately work around. Matt, Matt Dillon. Uh, decades Matt, ago? Di Matt Dillon is incredibly competent in UFS. Yeah, and he's left the previous project in a bad mood, and I, I bet he's referring to Matt Dillon because he could pro probably ha at least have worked on vnode contention issues. Uh, but this is a clickbait question, like so. We're talking relatively recent PR, right? Right? I don't know, maybe. I don't no, know. he's talking about UFS twenty years ago oh. and vnode issues that are still. Oh, going UFS twenty on. years ago. Well, yeah, and, so. Yeah, he's he's referring to Matt. People in, appear to be unreliable. I think, I'm sorry, we need about eight references and links to this. Otherwise, it's a useless statement. Uh, I won't even, no, not, no. Okay, so well, the whole I will thing again, is just that, that, that doesn't change anything for us currently, but yeah, I, the, I guess. It's the not. whole thing is vague and unactionable. Yeah. So speaking of actionable, I'm very grateful that uh, someone pointed out that for de for de uh, debugging P PCI pass through issues, try the different boot strategies, conceivably of including FreeBSD load for FreeBSD guest operating system. So there's that. Anything else actionable as we wrap up this call? I need to go hit a client site. No. Uh, Glenn, has this been useful to you? Are there topics you want to see covered in the future? Welcome for to perhaps what is your first of these such calls. 
I just... mean, I, I, I think it, it, it has been really interesting also to, like, you know, figure out what is going on and, and especially, you know, with Trugan's core and his future, um, you know, as, as I also uh, mentioned some time ago in an email that, um, you know, when, when I exist and started the whole scale thing and I started looking into, okay, how did they do the build system and all the things and like, I saw all these uh, very unfortunate in engineering decisions they had gone into to to building scale yeah. and and you know I first tried engaging uh you know with with the people at IX and basically told oh we're just following industry standard and I was like okay um I'm I'm going to hag away on 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 a you know on a custom by scale version and now with trueness core I was like okay some of, of the work I already have been doing translates well to you know to to fixing core as well and 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 I think it's it's very interesting to uh you know to see how we can move beyond trueness core and um Hopefully, someone or you know everyone are contributing to to making a better free BSD based storage appliance or toolkit. And you're welcome to check out my entire year of talks last year with a paper on the free BSD appliance, which points out the fact that things like libucl, libxo output, and all these things have made a a never better platform for doing things with minimum in base tools and just having tiny little shims to move mountains. So that's just my take on it. But you're welcome to, you know. I I, I already I already peeked at your your things you've been building and it's been really handy. Cool. And uh as if I'm soapboxing, uh one thing that bothers me, fortunately I'll say it again, fortunately IX has been great at working on the upstream OS, but any downstream, let's just say cute GUI that comes out of somewhere might never in a thousand years improve upstream, such as adding uh, dot include to jail or the dash C cleanup or state tracking in, in Beehive. It's like, and the tragedy is that those projects, and I'm guilty of having one early on that tested Beehive from day one, is that uh, they often stall because they are lacking fundamental things like state tracking. And then it's like, well, yeah, we can get to a point and give up. It's like, well, how about we address the underlying issues? And I thank you all for participating in calls and actually looking at fundamental underlying issues. So, and I'm sorry, having bug reports related to, a, a let's just say a front end, often doesn't have the underlying tooling to blame, such as and VME support, emulation support and Beehive not available in say front end X, Y, or Z. It's like, well, that's not Beehive's fault. Man. Okay. Yeah, and, and and I also like to add that, especially with with the way um, like like the front end, uh, you know, it has been very tightly coupled. With the with the appliance OS, and of course, some would say, "Okay, this is a good idea," but I would rather argue that you you need a loosely coupled uh, interaction and also integration, um, so you actually can swap out the the components either on the front end or the back end on the fly, um, and and um, I really hope that you know, with a fork going forward at some point in, in, in the future that, um, you know, arriving at a, at a front end with a loosely coupled uh, back end. So, so basically we can just, okay, now we have FreeBSD 15. Okay, just upgrade the packages and off we go. Instead of this um, custom, you know, build world and, you or know, put those packages on a Lumos on Omni OS and just say, okay, boom, here's the the, the beehive GUI in mm -hmm. an hour of work, maybe a weekend, as opposed to a complete OS project. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we will see how this plays out. I don't know. Watch this space, I guess. Uh, I probably have an hour off. I have one, one last information Jeez. point. 
there yes. are no no intentions on behalf of the Open Sense project to move away from FreeBSD. Oh. Um, and we will be getting a twofold improvement in WireGuard's throughput once they move to FreeBSD 14. Ah, I yeah. don't have a date for that yet. I just sent a short private note to Franco Fischl oh, asking him if they are, if they have plans. Current release is 13, and people were wondering why PFSense is more than twice as fast in WireGuard as OpenSense is. And it turned out that first, uh, NetGate has been developing a proprietary kernel module based on Intel reference source code that mm -hmm. uses CPU acceleration features for this elliptic curve stuff. And uh, there are also huge improvements in FreeBSD 14 that we will be getting for free yeah, uh, without the, the NetGate work. So yeah, once OpenSense moves to FreeBSD 14, we will have huge performance improvement. Well, there you go. And it will be a unique twist of history and faith that they are the prominent FreeBSD based GUI friendly appliance. But hey, have you, have you seen those machines, Michael? Which on, machines on, is that? The, the the Saizo official open sense appliances they are no, gorgeous they really? look incredibly sexy. Do they have Just go to opensense.org and click on shop. And okay, well, fine, I'll buy. I'll buy. Nerdgasm. <laughs> Jeez, do they run <laughs> raw FreeBSD well? Because that's always been a question yeah. of. Life. They do. They do FreeBSD extremely well. They do more than ten gigs of throughput without a sweat. And of course, if you want a 100 gig or something firewall, you need to go to Cisco or Arista or something. Right. Like so yeah. Um, not all vendors with FreeBSD based hardware have been good about raw FreeBSD on it. So okay, here's the shop.opensense. Yeah. Um, and they, they gave me a unit for free. They? That was just, just amazing as a gift. I asked them kindly if they had some leftover stock of older models because I wouldn't want to afford one at official pricing for my home lab, but I was perfectly willing to shelve out, say, 300 or 400 euros instead of 800 for something that is slightly outdated. And yeah. they said, oh, you're so a valued member of the community. We just gift you one. Have fun. That was amazing. Lucky you. Well, that is an attractive piece of hardware. And, ah, uh, gosh. I admit I wish there was a ridiculously small, ridiculously small, like Dell with iDRAC, because management's pretty important to me. And I'm using a T130 server that has its own shortcomings. But, hey, it makes a great P uh, open sense box. But it's big and, yeah, but. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, their their, their yeah. desktop appliances are it. all uh, fanless, passively cool. Nice. So if you yeah. have a business case for shelving out yeah. a couple of hundred, because yeah, it does ten gigs and it's yeah. nice. And look for their desktop appliances. Really, really, really good stuff. Ah, uh, you mentioned a few hundred. I'm seeing everything over five hundred euro. Could I be wrong here? I yeah. know nothing. Anyway, they're they're definitely less expensive ones. Oh, good. Okay, let's see. I've, I've always been arguing that for a business, they are essentially a no-brainer because they are guaranteed to run OpenSense well. Yeah, no question. They are very, they are very well built. And my former um, Sikya Computing Sidewinder customers, which was a proprietary firewall based on FreeBSD, they said, what? Say 600 or for a Recmount unit, 1,200 once? And no recurring fees whatsoever. It's all no, open source. Yeah. Shut yeah. up and take my money. Exactly. So <laughs> one, do we know about a U.S. distributor? Two, do we know if what they mean by security appliance is it running a whole bunch of like you know traffic splitting and running IDS tools on it or what? So where do you what do you get for five fifty? Go go to the individual model and you will see the specs down below. Four gigs RAM. So we talking to ZFS? Yeah, that's that's not the recommended model for running IDS. Uh, yeah. Probably. Yeah, <laughs> from yesterday's conversation, of <laughs> which many present have. Yeah, but they have have full specs, and they say, okay, this much uh, packet oh, routing throughput, this much VPN throughput, okay. not recommended for for IDS. 
8 gig. Take the 8 gig RAM and the 250 gig flash model and, and so on. And you get support and warranty, of course, yeah. right? You get a little support with that, hmm. which is which is great because the support contract is well worth it and, you know, costs a few bucks. So if you combine all that stuff, it's a, it's a really good choice. I, I recommend them to my clients all the time. Do you have hardware on site, Daniel? Like within reach? Uh, no, I I built my own, but I I actually um, I'm stopping support for a client. I told them to buy exactly these. Oh, okay, cool. And we have four Redmond units in the data center and uh, one desktop unit at the office, and I have clients with both Redmond and desktop. So I, I always always recommend them. Let's do a real simple smoke test here. Don't look at my history of like my Greek coffee, <laughs> which I discovered in Crete. Nope. Okay, so yeah, nope. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, so smoke test some more. Open sense. Yeah, okay. now you will find all these uh, protect me and China clones, and et cetera, mm -hmm. devices, which are also quite nice. So that is a magnificent metric of success that if you search Amazon for Mikrotik, you get suggestions of like Cisco trying to get your attention and pointing out like, hey, look at us. We're only four times the price and half the performance. Like, hey, look over here. And if you search for TrueNAS on eBay. I just bought again, one of their switches. Well, there you go. Which one? The the Cisco or the Mikrotik? The Mikrotik. Excellent. For my personal network at that's, it's that or ubiquity at this point. That was a conversation from just before the call. And yeah, I've got a pile over there. And they're, I mean, I trust you've seen the Latvian symbols on the boxes. Thank you very much. The Calpus is in front such. So and I've seen I've them been built to... in, the, in Latvian, like Olga, I think it was. Not set in your thesis. Like, hell, yeah. Anyway. And I just, I just tried my first microtech. And boy, does the user interface suck. I know it that and is, once once uh, once it's configured, it works really well. It yep. even supported by Rancid. And if you look at the text configuration that Rancid pulls out of this thing, it's surprisingly stringent and nice to read. The problem with the CLI is that they don't have real documentation. So who they wants have to put free BSD to your in, <clears throat> instead of a reference? But yeah. okay, it works well. I want to boot. I mean, the reality is wanna... I'm going to use this as a dumb switch, basically, that has 10 gig support. So, Yeah, I mean, me too, but I run router OS because switch OS sucks even more and cannot even do SNMP properly. So, <laughs> and, and finding my way to configuring VLANs and, and this single bridge and everything on router OS was quite a bit of an odyssey. Yep. It's all true. Well, Anything else to wrap this up? No. Uh, Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. And if it's smelling a bit commercial, these are all publicly available facts. So, gee, this website's existence is not a secret. So thank you, everyone. I encourage you to have a great weekend and like and subscribe. You're welcome, Entrenade. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.